this is Home Keepers. Grab yourself a cup of tea and just sit down with us. It's always so good to be here and to know you're there. And I just want you to feel welcome, 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 welcome. And it's a good day, a beautiful day here in uh, Central Florida. I hope it is where you are as well. I have a wonderful guest today. I really like it when we have an author because it gives me a lot of material to talk uh, to the guest about and that we have an author today her name is Amy Lynn and she has written a book behind the mask and as I read it I believe perhaps the greatest lie ever uh, perpetrated on the American people is the lie of abortion I think of the congressmen and senators who voted for that law Supreme Court justices who said it's okay Time is coming, friends. We hear an awful lot about revival and a move of God in the land. But his word is pretty clear. And when we have a nation that has killed over 50 million babies in their mother's womb, and we have a nation that says that it's okay for the same sex to get married, I think judgment is coming unless there's absolute repentance. And there's never been a bigger lie than the lie of abortion. And Amy Lynn writes very well about it. I want you to hear her story. And the last chapter is called about the grace of God. So any of you ladies who have had an abortion and you're listening to me, I want you to know that there is grace out there. There's no sin that his blood does not cleanse. But I do want you to hear her story because you'll probably relate to it, and I think it'd be very helpful to you. So I'm glad she's here. And we are making a recipe I'm just excited about and have a lot of questions about. It's called pierogi. I've never heard of it in my life until Stephanie told me about it. And uh, this is a recipe I think uh, her sister, someone sent to her, and she wants to do it. I'm telling you, the ingredients are odd. I'm just very anxious to taste it. So I'll join Stephanie in just a moment, but I again want to offer you the book Food Triggers. I can't tell you how full this book is of really great information. And we have a nation that's in trouble because of obesity. There's no question about it. And it's happening with our children. And this has a lot of answers for you. The Bible says, good understanding giveth favor. And this will help you understand maybe why you eat and when you eat and what it is that, that triggers that uh, great desire to do what you know you shouldn't do. So if you would like this book, we will send it to you for that gift of $15. That includes your shipping and handling. And you can call 1-800-229-0059 for um, credit card and debit cards. And someone will take your information there and also the address is on your screen and that's box 6922, Clearwater, Florida, 33758. And we'll get it right out to you. So this is your thing. This, y'all, this is gonna be the best dish we ever made <laughs> in 3,000 shows. <laughs> I've never There's seen her so excited about yeah. something that has to me such odd Odd ingredients, and, it could be, and I'm dying it's, to taste it's it. It's more memories, I think, for me. Why did you grow up with, uh, with Oh yes, my grandmother. Pierogi is that what you pierogies? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now this is pierogi lasagna. This is the simple man's pierogi. Because <laughs> <laughs> my grandmother used to stand in the kitchen. My grandma Miller. Well, first let me backstory. My sister Shelley emailed this to me. She said, "What do you think?" And I think, yes. Yes. <laughs> so um, my, my grandmother Miller used to just stand in the kitchen for hours and hours and just make these little dumplings called pierogies. It's dough. You take mashed potatoes and cheese and you fill it and you seal it. Put it, it. in the dough. That's yep. just carbohydrate yep. right out yep. there. Yep. <laughs> and then you um, boil it. Okay. Boil it. And then it comes to the top and then you fry it in butter and oh onions. <laughs> I know. I know. So this just take just the smell of this so takes So these me are little back. dumplings. They're little dumplings. But they have to be pretty firm and to go through all that. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm yep. Right. So she would spend and she'd make hundreds of them. Hundreds and we would just sit back when carbs did not matter to me. <laughs> 
<laughs> we would just sit and they would just be mouth poppers. Mm -hmm. I mean, you would just eat pierogies for days. So this is, I don't know, this may be even more of a memory thing for me than it is but well, they, they are delicious. Walk down memory oh, lane they are delicious. Childhood. Yes. But it's got lasagna noodles and put mashed potatoes. That just blows my mind. So regular pierogies are little dumplings yeah. with dough and stuff. So, so this, this is, is the lazy man's pierogi. So it's pierogi lasagna. Well, honey, it's all up to you except for this. Yep. Oops. She told me to do them over <laughs> here all the time. <laughs> Spray your pants over the sink so no one busts their hind yeah, on the floor. And in case uh, we haven't, you haven't heard it before, but a lot of you know who Wanda is. She's been on the show a lot. Mm -hmm. She was spraying and got it on the floor and slipped and was out of here for ten weeks. Ten and busted her knee. weeks. I know. And Stephanie pitched in and helped me a little bit upstairs. A with little. The, yeah, I couldn't wait for Wanda. No, yeah. I was kidding. So um, you emailed me and you said, could we use? boxed mashed potatoes or should we have uh, real and I said well if I had my druthers I will not use boxed mashed potatoes for this so these are fresh these are real. Ma real mashed potatoes okay all right so we have a sprayed pan we have lasagna noodles that are already cooked mm -hmm. and this is so this is so simple it's crazy I don't know who thought of it but thank you so this is just a scaled down version and yes this is just the super easy you're not going to be in the kitchen for days pierogi. Now these are way too long. I'm going to well, cut them. Um, a, lot, a lot of you email us for these uh, recipes and if you have time and all and you've You've done pierogi. Let us know. Yeah. Yeah, tell for us sure. Your I, I'm this shocked. This is my first experience. I'm shocked at how many people hadn't even heard of pierogies. Yeah. That was shocking to me. me. One, okay, so we have that. We have, we're going to use half, half of the mashed potatoes. So super, like well, I can't. Whoever came up with pierogies had not studied carbohydrates. Yeah, oh no, no. It's now a, this is a Slovakian uh, recipe. You think? Yeah, that's European. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, and you know I'm finding out probably why a lot of people have not heard them because you know it's a upstate like New York Northern. In New yeah. York they make these on this like and they sell them on the side of the road. No kidding. Yeah, like little pierogi stands. Are you see them with your fingers? Yeah. Oh gosh, yes. And for you don't hours dip, you don't dip them in anything. No, I think <clears> some <throat> people may use sour cream, but you need nothing. You need absolutely nothing. It, they are so. I think yummy. if I lived a hundred lives, I never would have thought of mashed potatoes and, and noodles yeah. together. So. Okay. So we the, so we have um, onions here now. The pierogi. Now to me, this is the only flavoring. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that has a taste. <laughs> Regular pierogies you would boil and then you'd fry in, in mm -hmm. the onion. So this is going to give you that onion taste that you would I have I think fried. this is really interesting. Oh my gosh, it Eating. is very interesting. Mm -hmm. This isn't even a redneck and then you thing. Repeat. This is a... Okay, so we have that. And then God bless you. Mm -hmm. Somebody <laughs> sneezed in case you didn't hear it. Okay, cheese. Which you put in okay. pierogies. And then some you, people put, you know what some people put in pierogies? Sauerkraut, but no. No. Not in my life. No. Okay, so we do that another layer. Mm -hmm. And I must say it Look is. Look at beautiful. how beautiful it is. It is gorgeous. I'm gonna cut these I down am a little. so anxious to taste it. I'm so anxious for you to taste so it. So all you all you do is repeat what you just did. Yep, right? and we put salt and pepper in the potatoes and in the onions. Look how nice that is. Oh Why my wouldn't gosh, it though? Seriously. Potatoes and cheese and talk about food triggers hello <laughs> <laughs> getting this recipe and the book no <laughs> yeah ah okay i gotta stop what i'm doing <laughs> there you go okay are you ready mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay this right here is like Gosh, a pierogi right here hot. this bite right here that's good <laughs> it is so good I don't understand it, but it's good. Are you okay? I cannot. She's back in her childhood. Even stand this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's back on memory oh lane, walking my. down memory lane with your little girl. <laughs> there may be a tear. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think we need oxygen. Well, I know you want this Wow. Recipe. So just piro uh, pierogi, pierogi lasagna. Yeah. Have if you come spell close it, we'll to know. spelling it correctly, we'll get it. Yeah. And oh I, my! You can write to us. Gosh, you northern people, I you promise can email you want us this. And that information is coming up on your screen. And shut up, Stephanie. Shut up, okay. Stephanie. <laughs> I'm sorry. And I'm so we'll excited. get it out to you. I want you to meet Amy Lynn, but enjoy your pierogi if you order it. Okay.
If you would like a copy of today's recipe, just write to the address on your screen, or you can email your request to artheline at rippy.org. good stuff and it, I'm sure it's an entree as heavy as it is <laughs> oh so I hope you'll try it and I want to welcome Amy Lynn the author of Behind the Mask welcome thank you all the way from Birmingham Alabama a beautiful city excited to be here Birmingham is especially beautiful in the spring, isn't it? It is. It is a beautiful city. There's a lot of dogwood there, is that right? Yes, and azaleas. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Well, welcome, and uh, what a story you write. When did it occur to you to maybe put your story down and on paper and try to get it out to people? Well, after I went through an abortion recovery ministry for myself, I, um, they asked me to come on staff with Save a Life and lead abortion recovery groups there. And it, what I would do is I would share my testimony at the beginning of every group because I wanted the ladies to know where I was coming from, where I had been, and what God had done in my life. And every time they would say, I mean, you need to write a book, you need to write a book. Uh -huh. So I finally, after years and years and years, put my story down on paper. Support it others. was a long time because how yes. old were you when you had the abortion? I was 18 when I had the abortion. Tell the, just tell the audience your story because um, did someone talk you into it or was it your own idea? I'm, I'm sure it's time of total confusion. It was, it was. Um, I, you know, I was raised in a, a normal middle class family, mom, dad, four kids. I'm the oldest of four kids. Um, you know, we were raised in a very moral home. We, we weren't, we didn't go to church every Sunday, but um, my mom and dad were raised in church. And, you know, my dad said, you know, I was made to go to church every time the church doors were open, so I'm not going to make my kids go. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we were out enjoying God's creation. So, um, you know, when I was 16 years old, I was involved in a date rape type situation. And I'll allude to that in the book. And um, that led to a downward spiral of hurt, um, sexual promiscuity, and that is what is, is the reason I ended up pregnant at the age of 18. And so by that time, I had a totally different set of friends, friends that, um, you know, were doing the same thing I was. We were drinking, smoking cigarettes, having sex, and... Um, you know, when I told them that I was pregnant, they they told me, they said, you need to have an abortion. Well, I'd never heard the word before. You never heard the word? No. No, I mean, we were very protected in our home. Okay. Was it legal then? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Uh -huh. It was. I remember when it wasn't legal. Right. So, uh, it was legal. And, you know, I asked myself, what is an abortion? They said, well, it's it's something that takes care of a pregnancy and, and you won't have to worry about being pregnant anymore. You know, bottom line. So I decided that that's what I was going to do because I was afraid to tell my parents. You know, if, if I had told my parents, you know, I would have never had an abortion. They would have said, hey, you know, let's deal with this. Let's have a baby. You know, they would have, my parents are the greatest grandparents in the world. And so um, I, I chose to have an abortion. We went down to the abortion clinic. And just like Planned Parenthood, any abortion clinic, you know, even though this happened when I was 18 years old, they still tell the same lies to this very Bunch day. Bunch of liars. They are. They are. Incredible. They are. So, you know, and they tell you what you want to hear. You know, I'm 18 years old. I'm scared. I'm pregnant. I go in there and they say, it's just a mass of tissue. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a baby. It doesn't become a baby until right before it's born. Oh, re really? Yeah. When you got ultrasound and you can you can see them sucking their thumbs in there. Even. Yeah, yeah. So, but the, but that's what a scared eighteen year old girl wants to hear. So, um, you know, I I you know, I ended up being too far along for them to perform the abortion at the time. So um, they re they recommended that I go to a local hospital. So I did. I went to a local hospital, 
and I'm laying there on the table and I didn't know what it was at the time but it's an ultrasound machine. They were doing an ultrasound on my stomach and there were two doctors looking at the, the monitor and so I asked them what they were looking at and they turned the monitor further from my view so I could not see what they were looking at. Because the baby was probably moving around a little bit. Yeah, so I would love to know you know, I, 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 would, I believe if I had seen what they were looking at, I wouldn't have had the abortion that day. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so now in the state of Alabama, the abortion providers are required to show the woman a picture of their baby, an ultrasound picture of their baby before the abortion is performed. Really? Yes, and, and a lot of women change their mind. I'm sure there's somebody trying to tear that law down. Oh, uh, well, uh, no. And, and also, too, we have a law where the abortion providers are required to have admitting privilege, privileges into the hospitals. Yeah, now that's a fight that's going on in Texas right now. Yeah. Yeah. So I hope, it, I hope they pass that. Yeah. And, and, that, and so we, we've had the opportunity to put a lot of ab abortion providers in Alabama out of business. Yeah. Can you describe just the atmosphere in, an, in a room that performs abortions, you would think that they might try to make it light and so forth, but everyone I've ever talked to said that there's just an awful feeling yeah. and women are crying. Yeah, yeah, and, and the, the nurses, I remember the nurses, um, holding, they were, there were nurses on either side of me and they were holding my shoulders saying, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay, it'll be over in a minute. And then after that, I, as, as they started pulling the baby out of me, I don't know exactly what happened, but I, I blacked out, passed out, I don't know exactly what, but I was out for hours because my friend who took me to have the abortion, when I finally came out, she said, she came running up to me, she said, Amy, I've been so worried about you. You, you. you were only supposed to be back there for two hours, but you've been back there all day. So I don't, I don't know what happened. I'm just gonna chalk it up to a memory block and leave it at that. But as an 18 year old, uh, you're somewhat mature, but they present this as a mass of cells. In, in your own mind, did you compute this as a baby? No. At 18? No. No, I don't know. I don't know why. I, I guess I had just never looked at the embryonic development chart. I don't even know if we had any of those back then, but no, I didn't. Um, some of the women I've talked to, and certainly more than one, Pat Layton comes to mind. She's got a wonderful ministry now, you know, to uh, uh, for the pro-life side. But she went on with her life. She didn't you know, just get it over with and go on. And they kind of give you that impression. Right. But it might be a long time. It comes back and it kicks them. And yes. she, I think she went into all these depressions and the marriage got mm -hmm. in a lot of trouble. Praise God, the marriage survived. Uh, but it took a little while to figure out, oh, that's the cause of me today of the exactly. depression and the confusion and the anger. Exactly. Is that what happened to you? Yes, I would have never related. I, I was 31 years old and I would never have related my present day depression, anxieties, struggles, just bitterness and just, I was a, a, an angry person. Mm -hmm. I would have never related all that to an abortion I had when I was 18. Never. Well, how did you connect the dots? Well, I, I was an abstinence presenter. I would go into schools and, and share a message of sexual abstinence with kids. And I'm all about prevention. So, um, and it, there's one exercise where we, um, we, we have a, a heart, a construction paper heart. Okay, let me back you up a little bit. How did you ever start preaching on abstinence? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> to, that, to that point, your history <laughs> didn't match up. Okay, um, I, had, um, I had gone through what is a walk to Emmaus. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, but I don't know okay. what it is. For well, sure. I, I went through a walk to Emmaus, and during that weekend, it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing that you can go on, I um, experienced God's love in such a mighty way that I actually cared about myself again. And that was in November of nineteen. So somewhere in there you came back to the Lord or you came to the Lord? Oh yeah, well when I was twenty five years okay. old I became a Christian. Okay. Yeah. So and still you <clears throat> the cause and effect was still 
going to take place. Right, right. And But you know, I, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean, oh, you're gloriously healed from all your past hurts. But right. you know, so, um, but, but yeah, I just, I, God, God showed up in a very mighty way that weekend in my life. Mm -hmm. And so I came home, I broke up with a guy that I had been dating. And of course we were having a sexual relationship. And I made a commitment to God. I said, God, I'm not going to have sex again unless it is with my husband. And I need you to help me. So this is where the abstinence came. Not have okay. sex. Abstinence teaching. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Yes. So about four months later, I, in a dream, God gave me a dream that, and he, sh I was standing in front of an auditorium full of kids and I was speaking to them about pro-life and abstinence issues. And so I woke up and I said, okay, God, is this something e that's already in place or do I need to start myself or what? So all fingers pointed to save a life. So I went to save a life and, you know, shared my story with mm -hmm. them and, 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 you know, they said, well, we've got three areas where you can get involved. You can counsel women who've had abortions. You can counsel women who are thinking about having abortions. Or there's one area you probably wouldn't be interested in. And I didn't tell them about my dream. Mm -hmm. And they said, this is where we have presenters going to schools and speak to kids about sexual abstinence. I said, that's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so when, did, uh, when in that time frame did you realize, um, I've never dealt with this abortion thing, that it just kind of comes crashing on you. Well, what happened is um, I was in I was in a school one day, and um, you know we can't talk about God in schools, mm -hmm. but you know we, we can tell the kids you know if there's a, a guy and a girl they come together in a sexual relationship. There's a bond that takes place, and you know if that relationship breaks up, then it's like part of your heart is torn off and forever a part of that other person. And and we would have a construction paper heart and we would tear off pieces of the heart and we'd let them fall to the floor and mm -hmm. and then you know we'd hold out this heart and we would ask the kids is this the kind of heart you want to give to your mate when you get married? And they're like, no. Mm -hmm. And so I, one day I looked at that heart and God said, that's your heart. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so I, I feel like God can do anything. And so I prayed and I said, God, please heal my broken heart. Two weeks later, I'm sitting at a stoplight. All of a sudden that, I, you know, I had to ask God for forgiveness a million times for having the abortion, but I had a flashback of that day lying there on that table and feeling them pulling that baby out of me. And I had not thought about that since that day. Mm -hmm. And I lost it. I, I went, I started crying. I, I, Amazing. I went to the lady who was over the, our abstinence program and she just held me in her arms while I wept over the loss of my child. I'm telling you, uh, when the Bible says we're fearfully and wonderfully made, it's a mouthful. Yeah. And that human psyche, that. Uh, that was in there all the time, and then boom. Yes. Um, and I, you got to get the whole story. It's in the book. We do have the website up right now. I'm talking to Amy Lynn, and the uh, name of the book is Behind the Mask, and how for so many years she's wearing this mask, a metaphor yes. for, you know, I'm fine, I'm happy. Yeah. Um, and uh, how old were you at the stoplight? at that time? I was 31. 31 and the, see, we're, I'm talking to people right now and so are you yes. who this has happened to. Uh, I remember when there was quite a movement out and a very uh, well-known movie star was part of it, that abortion hurts women. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was this kind of thing. It was the emotional, it was, yeah. it was the psychological. Uh, you went through, I think, a very dramatic uh, healing. Yes, God was very good. Uh, t tell the audience okay. about that. That okay. um, they really do bring it to a final conclusion, don't they? Yeah, they do. They do. Um, I, I, they, my abstinence coordinator, she recommended that I go through an abortion recovery group. I'd never heard of anything mm -hmm. like that, so I ended up calling the girl who was over that group and. Um, you know, we talked and um, the first night that I went there, the two leaders, they shared their stories that, you know, they'd had abortions and their heart was to minister, minister to people who'd had abortions. And, um, you know, they told us that we were going to be giving our aborted babies a name. I thought that was weird. And that we were going to have a memorial service to give honor, dignity, and respect to those women who'd had abortions. I thought that was morbid and I was never going back to that group. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so God had other plans. Mm -hmm. She called me the next day. She sensed my apprehension and she said, please, you know, just do your homework and come back one more time. So I did. And, you know, the homework was, you know, basically a lot of scripture reading, which I love. 
And so I did go back and I kept going back week after week. And, you know, and I, I kept praying about a name. I had always known in my heart that the baby that I aborted was a little girl. Mm -hmm. But um, there was one time uh, during uh, what we call Forgiveness Day, uh, God just dropped into my spirit the name Caitlin Marie. And I just knew that was my baby's name. And so that afternoon when I got home, I walked in and there was just the most beautiful smell throughout my house. Well, I didn't really think anything about it until I went to um, a bookstore and picked up a book of baby names and the, Kate, and the name Caitlin means purity or pure one and the name Marie means myrrh or living fragrance. And, and it was wow. like God just saying, I got this. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, there was another class where they brought out these two poster boards and on these poster boards, there was a dead tree on one, a live tree on the other. And on the dead tree, the roots were labeled abuse, shame, guilt, and the fruit of that tree were bitterness, anger, fear, mm -hmm. I mean, any rejection, any bad thing you can think of. And then on the live tree, the roots were love, worth, and acceptance, and the fruits were the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Mm -hmm. And I looked at that dead tree. I can tree. almost see that with you just talking about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I looked at the dead tree and I'm like, oh my gosh, that is my life. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how in the world did I get to this point? And so we um, we kept moving on mm -hmm. in the in the class. And so um, the week before the memorial service, they called us out one by one. And they called me out and they put a little handkerchief doll wrapped in pink ribbons in my hands. And they said, Amy, this is symbolic of Caitlin Marie. We can never, you know, replace your child wow. that you lost through abortion. But we want you to take this doll home, wrap it in a blanket, love on it, whatever you want to do this week, but you need to bring it back to the memorial service the next week. I boohooed because mm -hmm. I realized it's that... It's a real cleansing. Oh, yeah. yeah. We've got just one minute left. Oh, we and do? So, um, <laughs> There, there was a memorial service. It was very beautiful. It really finished very it beautiful. for you, didn't it? Yes. They even, I think you even talked about forgiving yourself. Yes. Which is uh, probably the last hurdle yes. and all. And you do have a beautiful daughter today. I do. And two wonderful grandchildren. And, and you have a ministry. Yes. And all. Uh, I've said it before on this program, the wonderful scripture in Romans, and we know. Most yes. people forget those first three words. And we know that all things yes. work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. And this, this pathway He will take you on yes. is something that's going to bring good, not only to the person walking it, but to those they know it's going to bring fruit. And please know you're forgiven and God still has a wonderful plan for your life. Amen. And please join me next time. Remembering there's no higher calling than that of a homekeeper. God bless you. If you should miss a homekeeper's program, you can catch up by going to www.ctnonline.com. Click on CTN Programs and then on Homekeepers. 